Knowledge is power. I'm sure everyone has heard of that phrase. But what does it mean exactly? It's the idea that knowing things or having an education allows a person to have more control over their life. It's the idea that knowledge opens up doors and helps you to make more informed, accurate decisions and choices. It might give you economic power. Having an education might pave the way to gaining a job after university. Knowledge of what is fair and just might give you moral power. Knowledge is also valuable in politics. It can give you power to advocate for or challenge state or corporate policies. But what if the knowledge we have is selective or even inaccurate? How does that affect our ability to address the most pressing issues in society? Now, one of the reasons why knowledge might be limited and only convey a partial viewpoint is because knowledge is also shaped by power. So who is allowed to learn? What you are taught and who is allowed to teach it or write it is affected by power, economic, social and political power. Lack of power, whether it's due to poverty, class, racial or gender discrimination, can often mean the doors to those forms of receiving and producing knowledge are closed. Now, what does that mean for those within education, whether it's students or teachers? It means we need to be aware of the way power dynamics shape the work we do in the education sector. We should know that we either have the capacity to perpetuate those power dynamics or to challenge them through our knowledge production. That means we need to think more critically about what is and is not covered in academic texts, reading lists and lectures and interrogate received wisdoms. So, if you're studying revolutions, why are you more likely to cover the French or the American Revolution rather than the Haitian Revolution, which occurred in the same era, led by black people, but was far more progressive in its demands for democracy and freedom? If we are studying the abolition of slavery, why are we more likely to see credit given to William Wilberforce and the abolition movement in England than to those enslaved black people who also campaigned for abolition, won their own freedom, and then fought for others, like Harriet Tubman, Muhammad Yarrow, or Frederick Douglass? If we are studying the Industrial Revolution in Britain and learn that sugar and cotton mills played a big part in the country's economic growth, why is it that we also don't study the impact of slave plantations in the Americas and colonial plunder in India, where the sugar and cotton came from? If we think it's important to study the emancipatory ideas of philosophers, why is it that we then ignore their simultaneous contempt for racialized minorities and the excuses they made for racists among them? And why then don't we turn to those racialized minorities such as the brilliant black philosopher Sylvia Winter, to hear their take on emancipation. And if we're studying the so-called pioneers of medicine or science, how comes we hear about their scientific discoveries and breakthroughs, but we might not hear about their support for eugenics, racial supremacy, or the fact some of their breakthroughs came from experimentation on racialized or disabled people. So as you can tell from these questions, on one hand, the history of racism and colonialism might seem to be on the peripheries of our academic disciplines, and yet it's everywhere through its blatant absence or misrepresentation. So how did this pattern emerge? In which the history of colonialism and racism, or the knowledge and efforts of people from the global south and racialized communities are so hidden in academic knowledge production? Well, it's a pattern that goes back centuries and is so normalized that it might often go unnoticed, especially if you don't think you are personally affected by these issues. Now, of course, there have been scholars and activists who have challenged these patterns of knowledge production for decades, even centuries. And in giving this talk, I am indebted to all those scholars and activists inside and outside of academia. But the old patterns are persistent. So, if we look back in history, whose voices and actions were seen to matter were defined by narrow and racist constructions of who was considered to be civilised, who was considered to have an intellect, 
and who will seem as rational. A lot of these racist definitions became solidified and given respectability by philosophers and scientists within European universities in the Enlightenment era. Take, for example, René Descartes' famous dictum, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. The statement connects the ability to think with one's being, one's humanity. And this may seem innocuous enough, but what happens when some people are seen as incapable of thinking rationally or lacking an intellect? Does this then lead to a denial of their existence and humanity? Well, it was precisely that belief that non-Europeans lacked intelligence and reason and therefore could not understand the difference between right and wrong and could never be civilised, which paved the way for colonisation, plunder and settler genocide in Africa, the Pacific, Asia and the Americas. I think, therefore I am, became synonymous with I conquer, therefore I am. The lack of worth attached to those colonised people's lives and their voices was then reproduced by their exclusion in the production of knowledge. But does that historical relationship between race, colonialism and knowledge production still matter today? And are there wider implications beyond our books and lectures? Can the things that get erased and ignored in our textbooks and lectures really affect our daily lives? Well, yes, all of this does have an impact. First of all, it trains us to ignore injustice in society or to see those injustices as minor inconsistencies that don't warrant attention. Because after all, We've been trained in exactly the same way to ignore the racism that can be found in famous works of philosophy or political theory. Also, the implicit suggestion passed on via knowledge production that the words and views of a racialized person do not matter or need not be included or are unreliable also has an impact in society. We see it in whose testimony in court is accepted. We see it when racialized people are assumed guilty before innocent, so that in the United States only 13% of the population are black, but make up 40% of the prison population. We see it when police brutality against racialized minorities goes unchallenged, where people shrug and assume, well, they must have done something to deserve that treatment, which only changes if there is video evidence of the brutality, as we saw after the heinous murder of George Floyd. In the US. We see the impact when racialized minorities raise concerns about their working conditions or call an ambulance but their word is doubted and they are sent back home or when their complaints are not taken seriously enough to warrant an emergency or they are denied priority access to a ventilator. Such inequalities have led to disproportionately high numbers of black and brown people dying from Covid in the US and UK. And we see the impact when 13% of the UK population are black or brown, but they make up only 6% of journalists in the UK, which means stories from racialized communities are not reported from a place of understanding, but via negative stereotypes, with hardly anyone in those newsrooms to challenge those narratives, either because they don't know or don't care. Now, the impacts I just described are so deeply embedded over long periods of time that the problem has become a structural one. If that's the case, what can any of us hope to do about it? Well, we should not feel helpless. There are small but important ways in which we can individually and collectively start making a change to the culture of education from within universities, especially since some of this culture emanated precisely from universities. And the reason we should make a change is not just because it's the right and fair thing to do, which it is, but also because it cultivates better, more accurate, more expansive, richer scholarship and learning. As the Mexican-American scholar Gloria Ansaldua argued, thinking and producing knowledge from the margins, otherwise known as border thinking, also contains a form of power the power of innovation and creativity that is often missed by those producing knowledge from the centre.
if you're from a marginalised background, you too have that power. So this responsibility to change the culture of knowledge production and incorporate more of that broader thinking lies across the board in academia. Firstly, teachers can contribute to this change by making their reading lists and lectures more reflective of a global and diverse scholarship and reviving knowledges that have been erased. Secondly, any academics working with journals can make a change. If you're asked to review an article or if you are an editor, you can encourage and recommend those submitting their articles to reference a more diverse scholarship and to give credit to racialized or Global South scholars who have historically been marginalized. And thirdly, students. When writing your essays or dissertations, who do you cite? Whose scholarship do you see as credible? How often do you think about this issue? You too can do something to introduce greater equality via your references, because as Sara Ahmed so brilliantly put it, citation is not neutral, citation is political. So to finish, even though the connection between knowledge production, colonialism and race has been deeply embedded over time, we still all have a choice as individuals. We can turn a blind eye to the problem and be indirectly complicit in perpetuating the problem, or we can make even a small contribution to tackling those inequalities by changing our practices of knowledge production.